Hello, welcome to the channel. Thank you very much to the sponsors. Without you, this channel would have folded by now. Last time we were talking about frigates and I would like to continue the conversation into the development of the classical 18th century frigate, what we understand by frigate, and eventually to end up with the new frigates that emerge after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Because it is a rather interesting circle that is being closed there. What goes around comes around. And also in this philosophical vein, we can point out that there is nothing new under the sun, just modification of old things. So returning to the beginning of the 18th century where we stopped last time, I spoke about the galley frigates, a type of vessel that I actually am particularly interested in. I do have someone in my archives, the logbooks of the Charles galley from its campaigns in the 1670s. Adventure galley, the famous or infamous, uh, pirate vessel of uh, Captain William Kidd, of course, is well known in popular literature. So far, no one has been able to identify the wreck of that vessel. But other galley frigates were constructed. In fact, it became a very, very popular, fast sailing uh, merchantman turned privateer periodically. It was galley frigates that were used by Woods Rogers during his uh, the, the voyage around the world. Galley, a story of a, the Blackman galley frigate has recently been published by the Heklut Society, by, edited by Colin Haywood. It is a very interesting book. Uh, voyage from England to Istanbul, Izmir and back to England. So they are frequently mentioned, they are extensively used, they are very popular vessels. Usually, unlike the Charles and the James and the Mary, they tended to be around 200, 260 tons burden, not displacement, I repeat again. Returning to the further developments, they were known for their speed, but at the same time, the sweeps, the idea of being able to move the vessel independently of the wind has always been so very attractive to seafaring folks. The problem, of course, is that this is a sort of a compromise and never really works perfectly. In the first half of the 18th century, especially after the end of Queen Anne's War, uh, popularly it is believed that the Royal Navy entered a period of stagnation over the following 30 or nearly 30 years of peace. And this is the period in which we see the tail end of the galley frigates and the semi oared vessels. There is the Planford, which Peter Goodwin wrote a book about and published in the Anatomy of the, Siri, of the Ship series uh, years and years ago. There were the sixth rates, particularly, were intended to be able to be rowed. For the fifth rates, they already were getting to be a little too large to be possible to roll them comfortably, or to even pretend that you can roll them comfortably. And uh, speaking of the Blanford, here is the 20-gun uh, vessel Blanford. In this period, we see standardization in the classes of the vessels. I lead you to the link down below to look for the Blanford if you want to get your own copy. As far as listing and paging through the book to see what is inside it, here it is on the sister channel, as always. The birth of the modern frigate really is... Uh, coming in towards the middle of the 18th century. It is theoretically at least development of French naval architects. They started working in this sphere uh, fairly early. By the end of the 17th century, you begin to see single-decked or flush-decked even, or very low-cut fast-sailing ships for commerce raiding. 
They certainly became very popular during the war for Spanish succession and they continued developing the class uh, onwards. The problem with these vessels was that, yes, they are fast, but they are fast in the right conditions. They could not keep the sea in all conditions because they were too small for that. In heavy winds, they could be overtaken by larger warships and then they, there was nothing they could offer to them. Well, you're a six pounder, you can't really fight a 32 pounder. So gradually the class began to enlarge in the 1740s, in the 1750s especially. By the 1750s, the Royal Navy had been shaken up, especially their shipwrights and the Navy board are shaken up by encountering the vessels that ship for ship were far superior to anything the Royal Navy could offer. It is a great credit to the Royal Navy's fighting abilities that they came on top despite the inferiority of their vessels. This is the period in which the True 74 develops, out of the 70-gun uh, third rate. This is the period in which the Rio frigate emerges, armed with nine-pounders on a single deck, fairly low, fairly long, but fairly large vessel, large enough to be able to operate in heavy seas and in heavy weather. These are, of course, the early small frigates. Most of them are 24, 28 uh, guns. Next to me here, of course, is an example of this type of small uh, 16th, 5th rate frigate. And as with every other type of vessel, in the second half of the 18th century, we begin to see the frigates enlarging, growing in size, growing in firepower, with more guns, with heavier guns, but there, purpose by now is very clearly developed. Sixth and fifth, uh, fifth rates were not used in the line of battle even in the 17th century, but by now even the larger fourth rates are too small to stand in the line of battle. They can be used as uh, squadron flagships on, on foreign stations, but certainly are not uh, ships of the line. And yet many of them are two-deckers still, 44-gun two-deckers that are still named frigates. Frigate of two decks and 44 guns. This state of affairs with single-decked and double-decked large frigates continues all the way into the American Revolutionary War. In fact, by the beginning of the war, these vessels, the two-deck 44-gun frigates, are considered outdated. They're considered to be too slow, too lightly armed to fight a large vessel and too slow to fight and catch or escape from the new class of single-decked frigates. So why did they see a revival in their fortunes in this period? The reason behind it was that they drew fairly little. They had heavy batteries. They could concentrate that fire on a narrow front, therefore deliver more uh, weight of fire per distance and were very convenient in these rows along the deeply cut inundated uh, American uh, Eastern Shore. So they did have their moment of glory in this period, but they also were recognized as insufficient as far as modern warfare is concerned. That pretty much was the last hooray of the 44-gun frigate. Now we enter the development of the large 44s. In our national mythology, of course, this, uh, these emerge with the Constitution class, like Philadelphia, Constitution, United States, President, the famous American frigates that will make the history of the United States Navy and cover it in quote-unquote glory in the early 19th century. But that appears to be time to be spread into another video. So thank you very, very much for watching. Thank you for uh, subscribing. Thank you for sponsoring the channel. And I'll see you next time.